I wonder how much we would be if our plug were pulled out of the great source. Certainly, as the full realization dawns upon us that our life has purpose, depth, and meaning, we ask ourselves, what must I do in order to inherit this eternal life? What must I do in order to create a greater bond between the universe and the I of the I am. I think that one thing that impresses me most at this moment is the fact that none of us possess an exclusive right to God. We must share the common time of contacting him. And so a problem that has long been on my heart in connection with both esoteric work and spiritual work in all religions is one I would like to discuss with you a bit this evening. And that is, of course, the problem of exclusivity. We have now at least probably 10 branches of the major religions of the world that are in competition with one another, all proclaiming themselves as divine experts. They all believe that they have the exclusive rights and the exclusive pathway that leads to heaven. And I'm sorry to say that some of them actually feel that unless people pursue God their way, there just isn't much chance at all. Now in examining these 10 major religions, I do not find any particular fault with them whatsoever. I don't think we can really argue too much with history or the fact that when Jesus Christ was upon earth, he was either Jew or Gentile. Most of us always, of course, think of him as a Jew of the Jewish sex. I'm not even going to attempt to solve that matter for you tonight because I really don't have any particular opinion. I have more or less piecemeal accepted the usual teaching on the matter. And I have supposed that, and always did suppose that uh, Christ was Jewish. I think the scriptures supported this. It says he came unto his own and his own received him not. I think it is a matter of record that he was crucified on a Roman cross. I believe in the ordinary anecdotes that are recorded about this man whom we call Jesus, this great soul, the only begotten Son of God. Well, that's another problem. I believe that we are all only begotten sons of God through the Christ heritage. In other words, I believe that all things were made by Christ and that Christ was before Abraham. Before Abraham was, I am. I believe that we are talking about the Logos and Bness all at the same time. Bness or the consciousness of God, the awareness, the inherent awareness of the universe within itself. Because the universe exists and always has existed. It did not actually begin. What I'm trying to point out is then that as in this old argument that existed for so long, if a tree falls in a forest and no one is there to hear the tree fall, does the tree make a sound? 
Well, if there's no ear to hear it, some argue that it doesn't make any sound. I have always believed it made a sound whether there was someone there or not. But it might not necessarily be interpreted by an ear. Do you see what I mean? I think many of these are rhetorical arguments. They're not really of specific value to us. But yet, at the same time, we recognize that the creative action of God with its designs has always existed in the fabric of nature as well as in the whole structure of our physical bodies. And the physical bodies themselves would really be beautiful instruments even if there were no mind available to that body to program it and to use it. It's still a very nice structure, but it wouldn't really prove too useful. People might say, what is it? What's it for? You know. But at the same time, when you mix it together, in other words, when you strike the spark from the flint and it falls upon the moss and ignites it, when the spark comes in contact with the physical side of life, then the spiritual spark is caught there and we see a blaze. The blaze, of course, is life either transient or moving. It is the a union between spirit and matter. Matter, of course, which is really a component of the Divine Mother, the Mater. This is a necessity to the spirit in one very real way because it gives form and dimension to the creative aspects of spirit. And so we are enabled to function in this domain. And the process is very important because there is a great, a glorious purpose behind it and that is the reason why there are so many religions. Because the greatest thinkers of all ages have involved themselves with the universe, its creation, with the mystery of life, the end of life, the beginning of life, and uh, the three-dimensional laws that are involved with our geometrical forms, with space and with time. These things were thought upon by the great generals in all the past history of life upon this earth. They'd stand there and they'd think as they'd watch their armies die. They'd think about their own approaching or imminent death. They never knew what moment the sword might take them also. Even before they knew the statement of Jesus, he who takes the sword shall perish with it. They were still subject to the same law. For the law has always existed and the law is inherent in the universe. But people tell us that they have the only pathway to God. They say that if you don't go their way, if you don't walk in the way that they tell you to, that you will be lost, as though your little flame in the universe will be put out. We should probably tell them then that any flame that God has lit in the universe will keep right on going through all the eternal cycles, that even if you put it out, the light will still travel. And this is an interesting aspect of life itself. When the taper of our identity is lit by a torch from the heavenly altar, that flame, be it large or small, keeps right on going through time and space and never, never stops, insofar as the light is concerned. There is one enigmatic statement that I'd like to take you through. And that is a statement attributed to Paul. He said, if we place upon this altar, referring to the altar of individuality, he said, if we place upon this altar wood or stone or hay, in other words, material that is combustible, he said, the fire is going to try every man's work. In other words, whatever you put on that altar, I don't care what it is, the fire is going to try that work. And when the fire tries that work, 
if it is combustible, what's going to happen to it? It will be consumed. Yet Paul adds another statement. He says, yet he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Denoting that man is not just composed of his combustibles. <laughs> it's rather an interesting thought, isn't it? That there's something more to us than all the trivia of our time. And I think that one great failure of mankind is his failure to apprehend that which is not dust in his being, that which is true vibrancy of spirit. But he does not, in most cases, understand the process whereby he transfers those marbles I talked about the other day from the sack of the personal realm, you see, where they're just they are just trivia because we are using and tying up so much of life just in the personal realm. Now he transfers it over to divinity and watches the marbles grow. Because people don't think of inert objects as growing or expanding. They have a bag of marbles and their dimension is a half inch. They expect that next year it'll be the same. So we should really understand that this is not true when you speak of spiritual treasures. They do when they are placed in the heart of the earth, they do expand their capacities. And uh, this is happening to all of us, whether you know it or not. Yes, you are expanding in an accelerated manner during a class because there is an intensification of that which takes place without necessary accompanying consciousness. In other words, your development is going on at an accelerated pace that is not necessarily keeping pace where you have consciousness and acceleration riding in the same seat. In other words, you don't have to be aware of your development during a class. It takes place in various ways. Now you go ahead and uh, you expose something to radiation. You expose uh, something to even invisible radiation. And you are going to find that the light rays will create growth expansion. So it is not necessary that we have a company in consciousness of our growth. In other words, we don't have to be conscious of our growth. It's still going on. And I think that uh, this is, is quite apparent in children, even from a physical standpoint. If you don't see a child for two or three years and then you see that child, oh my goodness gracious, you look at the child and you say to yourself, my, how big that child's getting. Why, I would never have known him or her if I had not seen them with you, people will say. And we ourselves even, after not seeing friends for perhaps a period of three to five years, or in the cases of some where you have not seen friends for 10 years, you're going to meet those people. You're going to be astounded at the changes that will have taken place within them. But you can't measure all these changes from the surface. I think there's a tendency for people to do that. Uh, people uh, seem to research the growth of the person inwardly by uh, their observance of personal, physical maturity. They see someone has matured a bit, or they've changed a bit. They wear a different hairstyle. I can just imagine what would happen to some of your grandmothers if. They came back and saw you looking like your grandfathers. <laughs> we have lived in a rather hirsute generation, but uh, <laughs> not any more so than in the past. You know, these things took place years ago. And I guess what's happening a lot of times is we're growing whiskers on our souls, too. <laughs> But that's not really what I'm trying to talk about from a more serious vein. I want to assure you that all of this exclusivity, which I'm sure would have distressed Will Rogers a bit. You know, he probably would have said something like, uh, these people are trying to fence God in. And it seems to me that is what a lot of people try to do. And therefore I'm going to talk to you about the telescoping of the knowledge of God. 
I believe from what research I have made of the Akashic Records, and I'm not trying to boast when I say this, this is purely a gift of God, and I have done a lot of research on the Akashic Records, and by the way, I'm deucedly slow. I may as well tell you. I am not speedy in most cases, yet in other cases, when I look at someone, I see their whole life record before me just spread out like a bunch of snapshots on a table. Sometimes I get so uh, troublesome to myself over this that I just switch it off for a while. I remember one time coming from Los Angeles to Arizona to Phoenix one night rather late, I picked up a soldier. And he got in the car and sat down, prepared himself to relax. Everything was quiet and then I started talking to him about his home and his brother and his sisters and his family. And pretty soon I started explaining to him how his father looked and how his father acted and how his mother looked and how his mother acted. And somewhere before Phoenix, he begged me if I would please let him out of the car. I had a captive man there. He was a prisoner. He couldn't get out of the car. So I let him out and went the rest of the way. But these things do happen sometimes, and believe me, in this case, it was purely unintentional. This was a bit early in my own life, and at that particular specific time, I wasn't trying to play a smart game or show off. I was just so thrilled with the development of the latent powers within me that I just had to practice them on everyone that I met. <laughs> I was like the sorcerer's apprentice almost myself. This was a terrible thing, especially for my victims. But believe me, I reached a stage where I went the opposite way, and I'm pretty close to that way today. I, I don't stick my nose in any of your business. I get your vibration almost immediately, but that's it. I mean, I don't go into the whys, you know, why are they this way? No criticism, I have learned to be completely neutral to these things and just place each person in the hands of God and if they ask me or there's some reason why I should take a deeper look, I do. But now, going on a bit into this telescoping of not just a psychic phenomena, which people call psychic phenomena, but in reality the way I use it is the spiritual sensibilities of the soul. You know, a rose known by any other name smells just as sweet, and some people talk of psychic things and don't understand that they really are saying astral, whereas other people are talking about spiritual things and don't understand that they're saying spiritual. But I do want to talk about the telescoping of the knowledge of the ancients from the Akashic Records. Now, I have probed the Akashic Records of Lemuria, and I lived upon Lemuria, and I've also lived on another planet, too, and and I have some knowledge of that planet. But the point is, I did not know this when I was born. And I didn't know it when I was a child and reached up as a child to spiritual intelligences. When spiritual intelligences appeared to me in my bedroom as a child. When I used to leave the physical body and swim in underground caverns at night with some of these beings and recall it. And used to wake up feeling that perhaps I was having a nightmare. I was too small then actually to have had nightmares. I didn't know enough about the world because many of the things that I saw then in these caverns underground, these things I found out actually existed in my later studies in ordinary science and so forth. And as a child, I had not yet had the exposure to the many, many states and parts of the world. No, I wasn't Tatiana. I didn't travel all over the world when I was about three and four and five months old. In fact, I never traveled more than a hundred miles from my house, I think, until I was about 14 or 15. It was rather interesting. I had a very sheltered early childhood. So you see, these things were genuine. But nevertheless, in my probing of the Akashic Records, I learned a great deal about life and various golden ages. I made many studies of Atlantis and they were not gleaned from books. If they were gleaned from books, and I'm not speaking disparagingly of books, but if they'd been gleaned from books, they would not have been personal. 
because I was able to enter in. In fact, as a child, you see, Cardinal Richelieu was very close to me in one embodiment in France. And then, when he was born William Randolph Hearst, the great publisher, I don't know whether you knew that or not, but that is who Hearst was. He was a reincarnation of Richelieu. Uh, did some of you realize this? Well, this happens to be true. And that's why he went over and brought so many of those things back, you see, uh, to California and built that Hearst Castle. When I was a boy, I used to come out in my finer bodies to California and I traveled all around that yard and all around his estate many, many nights. And I was present in his hall the night that this motion picture star, Orson Welles, was his guest. I was present in my finer body and I recalled it, I remembered it. And it was a, a very, very interesting experience. And uh, it was something that involved a, a canceling of time and space, in effect because I was able to be alive where I was as a child and still I was able to have contact with some of these past events in history and to recognize some of these things very clearly. So I'm not saying this to impress you, I'm just saying it as a point of interest. You can believe it or disbelieve it, it doesn't matter a bit to me. I just hope that you'll never make this fact that I made this statement a matter of your determination to either accept or reject the Master just because I said this. because. Uh, if you don't accept the masters, that's your problem, and I hope that uh, it isn't your problem. <laughs> but anyway, this is the way it happened with me as a child. And so, uh, a jigsaw puzzle, a very interesting jigsaw puzzle, was put together by all these experiences. And uh, in the course of my life, I was able to uh, find out that uh, much of the religious teaching that we have in the world today in embryonic form had appeared actually in past ages. In fact, I found that not only religion but science also uh, was very, very interesting in some of the past ages. Some of the marvelous advancements that took place in our time or just before our time were really the tapping of the memory of past events in the universe. Now let's take, for example, uh, Harvey Firestone and uh, the late Henry Ford. Ford and Firestone and Tommy Edison were friends way back on Atlantis. Some of you didn't realize that. And uh, when those gentlemen were embodied, you see, in our time, it was a perfectly natural thing by cosmic law that they should become the instruments for the release of such primitive phonographs as we saw at first, which were the forerunner of most of our magnificently developed audio systems of today. And then Firestone uh, was able to uh, bring about many wonderful things in the field of rubber and research that made possible our modern automobile. And so, uh, and Marconi got in there too, I'm not going to run the Italian short, uh, Marconi got in there and many, many of the early scientists that appeared all at once. Now notice, suddenly you have the 1800s and you have a pretty steady stream of stability throughout the 1800s and the time of Kit Carson and all these characters, you know. <laughs> we have some of them right here. <laughs> That's right. Not up here now, down in there. <laughs> I'm not going to cop all this uh, tortuous glory of history. I've had a little part in it, but then so have ye all. And so I think it's rather interesting that modern man today can view the exclusive teachings of Jesus as though they belong just specifically to our 20th century structures, which have really only inherited them. Now, I don't find any fault with this as long as people are tolerant and kind. But it's when they get vicious. You know, I think one of the things that probably hurt me the worst, and I've done a great deal uh, for most of the churches of the world, that is, God has done it through my hands. And I think one thing that hurt me very badly many years ago was the fact that we had an ad in Fate magazine. And there's a young man around 17 years of age 
that read that ad. And he became a subscriber to our pearls, a keeper of the flame, and he absolutely adored the teachings. So secretly to his parents, which I didn't recommend nor know, he studied our teachings for years, and after I think four or five years, he'd gone quite a ways with the keepers of flame, the boy decided that he would like to enroll in the University of Denver. And he was from the east, way over in Connecticut or somewhere. Actually, it was New York, I believe. New York State. So this boy persuaded his parents to let him enroll in Denver University, and he wouldn't tell them why. And then he came over to Colorado Springs, and he wanted to join the staff. He tried his best to have me persuade him that he should quit school. If I would tell him to quit school, then he'd join the staff. Well, I wouldn't. I told him, I said, you've got two years of your college in, and I said, I think you should finish. Well, that hurt him. That was the worst thing I could have told him, but it was the truth. Because in our world today, it's a good idea if a person can get an education, especially for a man, particularly for a man that has to support himself and a family, perhaps. A woman can often get by because she may marry. But I do believe uh, that in our modern world, it's necessary in many cases for people to have an education in something if they're capable of getting it and have the money to do it and the will to do it. So I gave him what was my heartfelt recommendation. So the boy immediately quit the Denver University and went home and told his parents, I'm going to transfer to this New York University. And so he told them about the Summit Lighthouse and his great faith in the teachings. But you see, he didn't have much faith in the teacher. And he went home and he told them that, and they said, you are going to the priest right now. And they got him by the ear when he was then about probably 21 years old. And they shouldn't have been able to got him by the ear because they had enough chance to do it before. But they got him by the ear and they marched him down to the priest. And the first thing the priest told him was, well, that's satanic. That is satanic. And the boy wrote me a letter after five years of studying secretly. And he said, I'm sorry, but I am forced by my parents and my priest to resign your teachings. So here is my withdrawal and I'm through. And take me off your list. I don't want to know anything more about it because it's of the devil. Well, that was a big disappointment to me. But it made me realize that the enemies of people are often those that are in high places of esteem where you would not expect to find them. Because I esteem every religion, and I never go out of my way to try to rob members from any faith. We let all of our members support whatever faith they're raised in. If, they're, if they wish, if they want to make our faith theirs, they may. We take them in to the fullness if that's what they want. But if they don't want it, we don't impose it on them. And that rather hurt me. Well. I'm not going to turn around and be like the guy, you know, who came into Macy's and asked a girl, one of the shop girls there, where he could find ladies' underwear. And she said, I'm sorry, she said, sir, I do not work in that department. How dare you ask me such a question, you know. In effect, that's the attitude. Now the man goes out and says, I'll never trade at Macy's again. Well, you're not going to do that, you know. We're not going to despise Catholics. There's many good Catholics. There's many wonderful Jews. There's many wonderful Gentiles. There's people of all faiths and many that are atheists that may turn out to be wonderful people. They're just trying to find their way. So we cannot afford to identify with negativities toward people. But at the same time, you cannot expect that people are going to suddenly treat you in a chaste manner. Just because you decide you're going to treat them in a chaste manner doesn't necessarily do it. Do you understand? So you can't expect it and you shouldn't expect it. But I'm going to say something that I want you to know about. There is an organization in this country, and I'm not even going to tell you tonight the name of that organization, but there is an esoteric organization and some of you people have their books. But don't try to figure out the name of the organization because I know you're going to be wrong. <laughs> but this organization has written letters all over against the Summit Lighthouse. And you know what they accuse us of? You know what they say we, we did? They say that we are an ethnic offshoot of the I Am activity. 
But this is absolutely untrue. I worked with Master Moria before I ever heard of the I am activity. And so it is not true. But now, if it were true is the way I want to treat it. Supposing it were true, let's telescope a bit. Now, obviously, Enoch had some teachings. He must have had in order to write the book of Enoch. And it's a pretty profound book, you know. Now then, we find Abraham, of course, was in his tent there when God came to visit him. That's before Isaac was born. And God came either in one or three men. There were, at least there was three beings. They seemed to be dressed as angels. In other words, they looked a little different than most people. I'm not sure that they looked a lot different than any of you. They may have looked uh, a certain way on the, on the outside, but probably it was Abraham's ability on the inside to discern that something was different about these men. And so he said, well, he said, I'm going to cook you a little meal now. I'll go and get you some food. <laughs> so uh, his wife, Sarah, she's in the tent there. And uh, he starts talking rather confidentially. And he says, how's things with your wife, you know? And he says, well, she's quite an old lady, you know. I mean, she's along in years and things are different with her now than they used to be when she was a girl. And he said, well, nevertheless, he said, you're, you're going to have a child by her. He said, how can I have a child, he said. And the man said, well, nevertheless, you will. And she heard it. She overheard it. She was listening. <laughs> you know. Either glad or happy or very sad news. So there she was listening. And here's the great one standing there. She doesn't know it's one of the great ones. Now, if, if they looked so much different, you know, why, she'd have known it, you know. And so she laughed. She thought that was the silliest thing she'd ever heard of. And he says, nay, but thou laughst. And she says, no, I didn't laugh. And he says, nay, but thou laughst. And he says, surely I shall return to thee as the time of women, and thou shalt bear a son and call his name Isaac. And we see Isaac is a child of promise. So there is no one today that can forget what we call the Hebraic traditions. I mean, because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are the patriarchs. So now along comes Christianity, oh, long, long, thousands of years later, because Christ comes. And so what we call Catholicism, and all this really means is universalism, is formed then, but not necessarily directed. There wasn't any pope back there, you know. I told somebody one day here, I said, they said, what do you do? And I said, I'm the pope of the Summit Lighthouse. <laughs> This was all a joke, <laughs> but you know what I mean. And so we find people creating the Father, you know, the, the Holy Father on earth, which is perfectly all right and all that disrespect is implied to him or anyone else. But the point is, this is back in the time of Jesus. And now what do you find Christianity building most of its concepts on? Why, the Jewish religion. You see what I mean? That's how you got your Christian Hebraic or Judeo-Christian tradition, however you want to put it. And so they borrowed out of the tablets of the law, out of the teachings of Moses. Well, Christianity, of course, was a step from the great white brotherhood level of moving man's direction to a greater awareness of God, and so Jesus revealed the Father. First you have God up here, as the lawgiver and the judge, the thundering from Horeb. I mean, you better listen, thou shalt not. And then all at once you have Jesus summing up the whole Ten Commandments and saying, well, what, what it all amounts to is, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and thy neighbor as thyself. Two commandments I give to you, he says. So you see, he made it quite simple. And so Christianity grew. And then along came Martin Luther one Sunday morning. I, I presume it was Sunday morning. I, I'm not really sure. But there he was with his... Well, by the way, did you ever hear of, of Luther and the diet at Worms? <laughs> but anyway, he came to the Catholic Church door with this uh, proclamation of rebellion. He didn't like all the things that were happening, and I guess a lot of things were happening about that time that were pretty terrible. And uh, so he nailed this up against the church door and 
They tell me he threw the inkstand at the devil. But in any case, whatever he did, we find that Martin Luther starts a church. But what does he use for his teaching? Why, Christianity, of course, and a little Judaism thrown in for good measure. You know. <laughs> so the awful sin that Martin Luther did, oh, that was terrible. And so Huss and the burnings at the stake and, and all of the things that parade through history involving the history of religions occurred. And now we see each of the churches of which we are so familiar, the congregational, uh, God's frozen people, the Episcopalians. <laughs> God bless them, they're lovely people. And they're the salt of the earth. I mean the pillars of most communities, don't you know? But. Nevertheless, their own bishop called them that. He said uh, their bishop stood up at a, at a banquet that I attended here about a year ago, and he said, uh, he said, as you know, he said, you are God's frozen people. <laughs> they have quite a sense of humor, some of those bishops, you know. But anyway, out comes the Episcopal and the Congregational, the Disciples of Christ, and the dunkers and the, uh, what, what are uh, the dunkers, you know, they strap you in a board, don't they, and lower you down into a pond to baptize you. So I want you to understand that they all came out of the same pot then. But now the pot is all different. And you wouldn't even know that they ever came out of the same pot. The only thing is that most of them recognize the cross of Christ. And so what is the Summit Lighthouse guilty of? but of coming out of the eye. I mean, it's not true, though. You see, if it were true, I would say so. I wouldn't be ashamed. But actually, the coming out of all these different groups is really an attempt at heaven to uh, create some degree of progress. But now, of course, we face one thing. What about heresy? Yes, there is such a thing. There are people in the field of religion that have no other desire whatsoever in starting their religion except to fleece the public. And that is the truth. Personally, I would much rather, if I were so inclined, to be in the field of commerce. It would be a lot more fun. It's not any fun sometimes to develop an ulcer almost because you have to sit up at night worrying over what somebody thinks, so I quit. You know what I mean? But actually, it happens nevertheless. The field of religion is a very difficult field. I would never have chosen it except that the masters chose to put me into it. I'm not about to square the account with them because I don't feel any hostility toward them about it. I long ago pledged at inner levels to serve the masters. And uh, this is my gratitude. I have a great deal of gratitude for all the grace that they have and what grace they've given to me, such as it is, and I certainly am not going to deprecate it because I think that owing to the kindness and understanding of people, we've been able to help a few people. And all we're looking for now is can we help more people? And that's what we're trying to do. But there are people that even subliminally, in other words, below the threshold of consciousness, they really want to get into a religion because they think it's going to make them the big cheese. But to tell you the truth, there are many fields I would like to be in other than this because they would give us a greater level of respect from the world. I don't think that you are kidded at all by the fact that prophets have always been stoned and persecuted and despised and rejected of men. This occurred even among the Hebrew people. The Hebrew prophets weren't particularly liked. And old Jonah surely got thrown into the ocean and swallowed by the whale. Now, whether you believe that or not, and I believe what's written in most cases, I think this is a possibility. It doesn't make too much difference to me. I mean, I'm not going to get upset over it. Because I think we can endure with the facts that survive. The facts that we see around us, to me, are sufficient. We know our heart beats. We know the earth keeps pretty good time in its movement around the sun. We know that uh, physical life is quite scientific. And it checks out. 
far too clever, as far as I'm concerned, to discount it. I feel sometimes as though the chances of the world having been as the world is today by mere happenstance, in other words, a problematical thing, uh, are about as remote as you and I taking our wristwatches off, busting them with a hammer, throwing them into a, a little paper bag and taking them up in an airplane over here and then scattering them around over uh, Santa Barbara and then them coming down and ticking on the ground. I think that it's just about as big a chance, you see, as, as, as for the universe to be a happenstance or as for that to happen, which it wouldn't happen, of course, because it wouldn't have anything to do with your ability as a pilot, you see. And I doubt very much if uh, jewelers are hanging in the air and are going to start assembling the pieces of the watch as it falls. So I think that most of us have to recognize there's a great deal of reality here. We have to sort out sometimes and ferret out and recognize what we can use and what we may be able to use in the future and what we think we'll never use, well, please don't throw it away. Because I want to tell you something that's so funny that it'll give you a real belly laugh right to now. And that is that when we drove past this place and somebody said, well, there's B'nai Barith, and they said, that's for sale, and it's all zoned for a church. And I said, don't tell me. I said, I'm not buying that old building. I said, that's a terrible old building, and I said, I'm not buying it. Do you hear me? I'll never go there, I said. Never, 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 never. <laughs> so don't say you won't do anything because you'll probably wind up doing just the thing that you say you'll do, not do, I mean. So the thing that I wanted to tell you is, they accuse the summit of having come out of something. Well, isn't that just awful? You all came out of something. <laughs> and all the religions came out of something. But you know, the poor people sitting all alone with nobody to prompt them, they read this letter, they look it over, and they see the formidable headline at the top of that letter, whatever organization happens to be the letter head. In other words, whatever organization happens to have their moniker on that, you see? They'll look at that and then they'll look below and they'll read that. Why, it's the gospel that came right down from heaven. And they better just sever their connections and pack their bags and get out of the summit right then and there. And that's what some people actually do because an organization tells them to do this. Well, this is the problem today in the world. But I've always believed that it is important to listen to your friends as well as your enemies. Now I know this will not be agreed on by a lot of people. A lot of people in the world today will say, the only books I read are the books that I agree with. Well, the reason I'm saying that is because you know about a quarter of the people that we've taken in in the past year are people that came to us because they didn't believe in us. And they wound up being our best supporters. But I think it's a tragedy that the world has this attitude and I hope this year we can change some of this attitude. And the reason I talked about it at all tonight was because I wanted to give you some of the background. I don't want to give it to you uh, by names. I'm not interested in hurting people. I don't want to hurt organizations. I wouldn't do that for the world. They hurt themselves too much without my help. You didn't get that? <laughs> All right. We're having quite an explosion in San Francisco. Isn't that interesting? There's a lot of people up there in San Francisco that are coming to realize, the young people I'm, I'm talking about are coming to realize that all of this tradition and all of this cursing of other organizations just because they don't happen to proclaim a, a tradition that's so many thousands of years old has no validity at all. People are starting to think for themselves, thank God. And uh, I think it is making a change. After all, whether we like it or not, and I'm talking to all the people in the world, whether, whether the world likes it or not, the young people are going to have it longer than most of the older people. I mean, they've had it, you know. But don't get the idea that we're not trying to keep the older people that are serving the light right with us. Believe me, we are. And I'm here to tell you that we've got people all the way to almost 90 at the Heart Center 
and they're mighty good. Some of your pearls are being stuffed by hands almost 90 years old. Did you know that? A lot of devotion is going on. Here you have people sitting there, teenagers, that were born back in, let me see, what would that be now? 45? 55? Yeah, 55, yeah, yeah. For a minute I had to think, you know. But in other words, you have these 55 kids, you know, and you have even some of the 60 kids, you know, but they're not with us yet, but they're starting to. In fact, one of our girls, her brother, who's only around 10, 11, or 12, he wanted to come over to one of the classes, and he says, I can't hardly wait till I grow up, he said, until I can get in the summit. Well, if you don't think that tickles my funny bone. <laughs> it's most delightful because there's nothing wrong with the older generation. They've made mistakes, and so has the younger generation made mistakes. We've all made mistakes. But the point is, it's this calling the kettle black that bothers me the most of all. Let's forget it. So we go on from our mistakes and the level thereof, and we start to proceed to get some business done that's going to make a better world. And that's why I'm up here tonight to talk about this subject. Because I like to get down to earth once in a while. As some of you might say down to the nitty gritty part of it. Because it's there. And none of us can deny it. And there's a lot of funny stories I could tell about it, but we have the serious business of finishing the class. Thank you and God bless you.